right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon. The webinar should now be live. Oops. Um, so I'm just going to kick us off. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Badali, and I'm the research lead at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. Um, the Alzheimer's Society is very pleased to be welcoming, welcoming you to our third ASRP exchange webinar uh, that is being offered through our provincial support program. Um, this series has been developed to feature Alzheimer's Society research program recipients who have completed their funding and who will be speaking to the outcomes of their ASRP supported research while also addressing how their results have and will continue to impact people with lived experience. So with me today, I have my colleague, Caitlin Jaggers. Um, she's our research program assistant at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and she will help in moderating today's uh, program. And we're also very pleased to have um, our colleague, Sean Perrin from the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario. She is the chief marketing and development officer, and she will be helping to moderate the Q&A session um, at the end of today's webinar. And so, I will pass it over to Caitlin, who will do another introduction and run over some of our housekeeping tips. Hey, thank you, Jocelyn. So um, as mentioned, my name is Caitlin. I am the research program assistant at the Alzheimer's Society of Canada within the research knowledge translation and exchange team. And I will start off today's webinar by going through the agenda presented here, and then we will pass it over to our presenter, Dr. Fernanda de Felice. Before we begin, please note this webinar is estimated to be under one hour in length and is being recorded, but that only the video and audio of the presenters is captured during this recording. The presentation recording, in addition to the PowerPoint slides in PDF form, will be made available on connection following today's webinar. Today's webinar is presented by Dr. Fernanda de Felice and is being offered as one of the ASRP exchange webinars within our new Provincial Support Program, Meet the Researcher Series. We are so pleased to have Dr. De Felice here with us today to present her project, FNDC5, Irisin, as a novel therapeutic approach in Alzheimer's disease. This project was funded by the Alzheimer's Society Research Program starting in July of 2017, with project completion in June of 2019. Dr. Fernanda de Felice is an adjunct associate professor of the Center of Neuroscience Studies and Department of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She further holds a position as an associate professor of biochemistry and neurosciences at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Her research focuses on investigating the cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying the connection between Alzheimer's disease and diabetes, insulin resistance and Alzheimer's disease models, and how diabetes and obesity lead to defects in the brain. She's also so, um, interested in developing other models that can present neuropathological and cognitive correlates of the human disease. With the assistance of our co-host, Sean, we will be moderating a short question and answer period following today's presentation. Please use the Zoom chat box feature if you have any questions you would like to make or um, comments that you would like to pose. Uh, during the presentation, uh, but please note uh, we'll be holding off on addressing these questions and comments until the presentation has concluded. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Fernanda de Felice. All right, so Fernanda, if you want, you can share your screen. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I am. Yep, perfect. So thank you so much, Jocelyn and Caitlin, for the invitation. And Sean, I'm very glad uh, to be here and participate in this webinar today. Just a second. Make sure we have power. Until the end. And I hope everybody can see my, my slides now. Yes? Yeah, looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I, once again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and present some of the research um, that I have uh, been doing in my lab and that was uh, supported by Alzheimer's uh, Society Canada. And I will explain to you because it's very, we, we scientists have, I, I think we put some funny names and letters in molecules, but I will try to make it very simple for you. Instead of F and DC5, I will call irisin all the time uh, to make it simpler. 
And um, um, I will show you uh, a little bit uh, of this uh, uh, recent work that we have been, uh, we have carried in the lab. Uh, so just uh, for introduction, um, I think um, uh, Jocelyn and Caitlin did a great job, uh, but I am from Brazil. Uh, so I did my uh, PhD uh, in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And then I went for a postdoctoral training at Northwestern University in the US. Um, and uh, then I actually returned to Brazil, started my lab and have been here um, uh, at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario uh, for the past four years as um, a visiting professor and got this adjunct status. But I'm happy to tell you that um, uh, I will stay permanently here at Queen's uh, and I will def definitely move here to, to Canada and to Queen's. And I will uh, tell you how actually um, everything started, uh, my interest in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so this is a picture of my father-in-law, uh, José Pelúcio Ferreira. Uh, he had Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, almost 20 years ago now. And even though I, every time I get surprised that it has been so long that he passed away, um, the memories are still uh, very present. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Uh, he was a caring uh, person and um, he, he had a beautiful mind. So he was an economist, uh, but he has always been fascinated by science. So uh, in Brazil, he was actually responsible for um, creating some important uh, foundation uh, um, projects aiming at uh, providing support to science. And in the first stages of the disease, um, we still didn't, didn't know what was going on, but um, after um, some visits to the doctor, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It was very difficult, but just a little, uh, a few days later, he got a call uh, from uh, the recent um, elected president of uh, Brazil asking him to be minister of science and technology. Unfortunately, he couldn't take the job. He knew what was going to happen to him in the near future. And um, it's very sad. So um, I realized um, a long time ago that um, uh, this disease um, is very cruel, uh, is devastating for the patients, uh, but for the family as well and caregivers uh, that have to live with it. And this has um, uh, the idea of Alzheimer's disease and uh, the idea uh, of how important uh, memories are has permeated in our family. Uh, so here, um, there is a picture of um, my three daughters, Bruna, Amanda, and Chiara, the little one. But when Bruna was a little, so these two were uh, actually able to meet um, um, their grandfather, and uh, they realized um, how hard this disease is. And Bruna, when she was 11 years old, she wrote this text, and I think it was very important, showing um, uh, how she felt and um, how um, um, we all consider like uh, memories are such um, strong and important feelings. You can't forget them, you can't make their difference. And so this is um, actually the basis of um, my passion for um, research on, on Alzheimer's disease. And uh, talking about um, the importance to um, study uh, Alzheimer's disease and talking about um, uh, the prevalence of the disease. We now know that there is 50 million people currently living uh, with dementia or wild. And uh, we know that Alzheimer's disease is um, by far the most prevalent form uh, type of dementia. And this number um, is um, going, is expected to triple by 2050. Uh, of course, this has a huge uh, impact for the healthcare systems um, uh, in the whole world. And in Canada, this um, uh, is also an important problem. Uh, I think everybody um, knows someone that has Alzheimer's disease, uh, even if it's not uh, in its own family. Uh, and the numbers are expected to increase, of course, because we are being able to deal with other diseases to treat, uh, but uh, still there is nothing. Uh, really uh, uh, that's capable to, any medication that is capable to slow down uh, or prevent or cure Alzheimer's disease. Um, and this 
uh, talking a little bit about the history of Alzheimer's disease, this um, uh, uh, is a loyal timer. Uh, so he was a, a German physician and he was uh, the first um, one that uh, followed and described um, uh, the first uh, reported case of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is August Detter um, um, and a, a patient of Dr. Aloy Alzheimer. And um, we all know uh, that patients with uh, Alzheimer's disease, they have different symptoms. Uh, this includes memory loss, difficulty in communication, learning, thinking, and reasoning, personality changes, and also behavioral symptoms, including delusions and hallucinations. And um, I think in his um, initial notes, um, when I read it, it got me very, um, uh, I paid a lot of attention to this. Um, it touched me because he was saying that in one moment when he was uh, following this patient, he asked her to, to write her name uh, in a piece of name, in a piece of paper, and she couldn't do the task. So he asked her again to try to write her name down in a piece of paper. And then she looked up to him and, and, and she said, I have lost myself. And I think this represents very well uh, how a patient with Alzheimer's disease feel. Um, for those uh, who have um, had the opportunity to uh, live uh, with someone with dementia. And we all know as well that it's not just like these symptoms, like uh, we talk a lot about memory loss, uh, but this disease is very uh, cruel, it is progressive, and, um, and at the end of the, uh, uh, of the progress of the disease, we know um, that it has devastating effects in uh, global um, um, uh, health uh, of the patient. And look now um, in the microscopic level what happens in the Alzheimer's brain, and I believe uh, most of you have already seen these uh, images. We can um, appreciate that uh, the disease is really uh, has an important impact in the brain. So here in these um, top images we can see the whole brain, and while you're in a healthy aged brain, the, uh, the it has this aspect. We can see clearly see the atrophy of uh, the brain of Alzheimer's patient. And uh, if you turn this uh, brain up front and then slice this brain, this is what we can actually see and we can get a better sense of what is going uh, inside the brain. And I hope you can appreciate here, these are the ventricles. Uh, we have um, an enlargement of these ventricles compared to the normal brain. Uh, and we can see that the uh, decrease in the thickness uh, of the, uh, this part of the brain, the cortex uh, uh, region, um, it's much more um, uh, slimmer here. And also um, here we can see an important effect in other brain areas. Here we have the hippocampus, which is a brain region very important for memory, is one of the first uh, regions um, affected in the disease. And this is why patients have this um, um, trouble in remembering uh, things and tasks uh, and so on. And this just shows this important um, atrophy of these um, brain regions comparing a normal and Alzheimer's brain. And when we um, do some staining that we can do in the lab and we look in the microscope, uh, we can see two abnormal structures uh, that are not present in normal brains. And uh, we can see these clumps here, kind of yellowish brown, uh, and they are the so-called amyloid plaques. Uh, they are formed by um, a small piece uh, of a protein, a peptide, uh, the bad amyloid peptide in an aggregated form. And, in, and this is outside the brain cells. Here are the brain cells, the neurons, the nerve cells. And inside these cells, there is also the second major feature of Alzheimer's disease, which is um, tau. Uh, it's another protein in a different form that also form these uh, tangles, the so-called neurofibrillary tangles. And a lot of his research has shown uh, that these two uh, abnormal structures, uh, they are involved in neuronal dysfunction, um, and um, also in memory and dysfunction and cognitive dysfunction that Alzheimer's patients uh, present. Um, so 
I'd like to show you now um, a list of uh, the uh, reported studies um, that have been presented uh, in an NIH site called clinicaltrials.gov. And so far, we have had uh, almost 2,400 studies on Alzheimer's disease. And out of this big number of studies, only four compounds uh, actually translate into the clinic. Um, unfortunately, um, none of these compounds uh, actually uh, prevent the progression of the disease or cure the disease. Since 2002, uh, about 350 compounds were tested in humans and only memantine uh, actually translated uh, into uh, AD clinical practice. Um, with just modest, modest um, effectiveness uh, in promoting cognitive improvements. We now have um, another antibody that is supposed um, antibody against this plaques that I mentioned to you, against the amyloid that formed the plaques. Um, always, uh, uh, again, I didn't have like a lot of impact in the study, uh, but since there is nothing really there, um, um, people um, are eager to, to have a new treatment, a new medication, uh, and this is something that uh, we are all looking for. And talking about, well, let's think about ways uh, that um, have uh, been linked to uh, brain health. And uh, exercise, well, we have heard a lot uh, in the past years. We all know that exercise is important for the body, right? the peripheral tissues, uh, it's good for the heart, um, um, increases uh, blood flow, uh, oxygen flow in the tissues and improve many other um, uh, different um, uh, aspects uh, in the cells of our body. And more recently, uh, it has gained the attention the studies showing that uh, exercise can also benefit the brain. So it has been shown to increase the production of uh, molecules uh, that are important for repair uh, of neurons and promote um, brain health. Um, it improves memory in humans and in animal models. Um, it is good for attention, improves attention, making decision skills, uh, and many other, um, uh, uh, it has many other um, uh, good um, outcomes for uh, the brain. And what we know now about um, Alzheimer's disease uh, is why is it so hard again uh, to treat Alzheimer's disease? Uh, well, it is a very complex disease. That's what we have learned from um, over um, 10 year, uh, 100 years of research, but actually, in fact, the last four decades have been um, the decades that we have learned the most. Um, it is indeed very, 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 I would say the last three decades that uh, when uh, we gained a lot of information. Uh, so it's very complex. There are too many things, wrong things going on in different um, um, brain cell types. Um, and uh, there uh, are involvements of genes um, and um, also the environment. So there is a combination of um, um, the complexity of the disease itself, uh, genes, environmental, and lifestyle uh, that uh, will actually lead to the disease. So we now understand that um, the initial modifications in the brain that will uh, lead to Alzheimer's disease start now decades before uh, we can um, uh, actually and detect the initial signs of cognitive decline that uh, makes the person to say, well, there's something wrong, the family recognizes, and then uh, it finally um, decides to go to, to the doctor, to the physician to ask for advice of what's going on. Uh, so uh, it's very important to um, uh, search for ways to prevent the disease and also to search for new medication that um, will be uh, effective for the disease and ways to detect Al Alzheimer's disease very early. So can, we can start to treat Alzheimer as early as possible. Um, and so physical exercise has been shown uh, to be uh, an interesting approach to prevent Alzheimer's disease. So now we have a lot of studies showing that it improves brain health. And some studies 
um, that are uh, clinical and um, have followed um, um, uh, a number of patients uh, suggest that Alzheimer's uh, that physical exercise can actually prevent or delay uh, the progression of the disease. Um, and so now I'm, I'm very happy um, to, to see that in, the, in some of the most important societies uh, in the world, uh, there is clearly in the website saying stay physically active, be active, physical fitness helps your brain fitness. So this is Alzheimer's Society Canada. Um, I'm just taking this from Alzheimer's Society from the UK. Um, again, talking about the importance of uh, physical exercise, highlighting that of all the lifestyle changes that have been studying, uh, studied, studied uh, regular physical exercise appears to be a very important way uh, that can uh, keep your uh, help to ward off Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's Association from the US uh, also highlights the role of exercise. And while we are recognizing the importance of physical exercise, what researchers have been trying to do is uh, to search for molecules that are actually responsible for the beneficial effects of exercise in the brain. And this is what uh, we have dedicated a lot of effort. And uh, we ended up uh, studying irising, uh, which is an exercise-related hormone. Uh, so this is the, the, the letters FNDC5. And why is, OK, so this is um, um, short for fibronectin fibronectin type three domain containing five, you don't need to pay attention to this, but it's just to show you that there is a large, this is a schematic representation of a protein. Uh, and irisine um, actually is produced after this large protein is cleaved. So it's a part of this large protein. Uh, and irisine uh, was actually, uh, we know, I, I, I'm pretty sure um, everybody heard about insulin that is being used to treat um, and diabetes, but uh, insulin, we are now celebrating uh, the 100th discovery of, of insulin. And to give you an idea, irisin is very recently known by, by, by science. So it has been discovered in 2012. Um, there's not even 10 years. Um, uh, it has been discovered by Bruce Spielman from Harvard University. And he named this hormone after iris. Um, She's gods of the rainbow from the Greek uh, mythology. And she uh, was actually um, supposed to act as a messenger for Zeus. And uh, in his view, uh, in his mind, um, Bruce Spiegelman thought that irisin could be an important messenger, um, sending messages from one tissue to the other. And then uh, because my, in my research, I investigate the role of hormones in the brain uh, in the context of Alzheimer's disease, I decide to investigate whether uh, irisin could be beneficial in Alzheimer's models. So what we found was, uh, and this data was uh, uh, published um, uh, in this um, article um, in 2019, was that in patients with Alzheimer's disease, when we look in their brains, post-mortem tissue, there is less irisin. We are also able to collect a fluid that um, uh, travels around the brain, uh, which is the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And in this fluid of live patients, uh, we can also detect less irising in the Alzheimer's patients compared to um, aged health controls. Uh, and when we went on to uh, look for the effects of irising in uh, animal models of the disease that we have in the lab, we found that irising was able to um, uh, have beneficial effects in synaptic plasticity uh, and memory, uh, um, the effects that uh, this um, um, sort of ADMIs presents. Uh, so uh, it, uh, the data was very promising because uh, these mice, they um, already have the pathology and memory deficits when we started the treatment with um, irising. Uh, so it was actually able to revert in mice um, and memory uh, problems. And uh, this is um, a cartoon um, showing um, uh, a summary of what um, our results from this study 
uh, presented. I will ask you to forget this because this is very complicated. Let's just focus in the main message. Uh, so following exercise, our muscle tissue produces uh, iris in this hormone. It travels through the brain and it um, uh, improves these complex mechanisms that um, uh, improves memory. And um, after uh, these findings, what we have been doing is try to make this um, as a possible medication for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it would be uh, a medication that would be able to reproduce uh, the effects of exercise uh, or boost uh, the effects of exercise in the brain. And um, of course, we want people to keep exercise as much as they can, but we know that as we age, uh, many of us, we have locomotory uh, problems and, or vision problems, some other problems that uh, prevent us uh, from doing regular exercise. It's not easy as well to do regular exercise. You need to have a lot of motivation. People with depression, there is a lot associated with Alzheimer's disease. They can't really uh, exercise. So it is important to develop a medication that reproduces uh, the positive actions of exercise. Uh, and we ha have been thinking about ways to develop uh, uh, um, an irisin-based medication that would reach the brain and improve uh, memory. So we have used two approaches, and I will present you uh, the first uh, approach that we are uh, following, pursuing. Uh, this is what we call the next big steps in our research. So we are trying to use gene therapy to increase uh, brain arisen uh, levels and um, animal models of the disease. And I hope you have uh, heard about gene therapy and I will just present you on a scheme here. So this is based on a deno associated virus that increase um, uh, the production of irisen. Uh, so we can um, construct these virus in a way that they increase the levels of irisin in the periphery, that's what we want, and so that irisin can uh, be transported to the brain uh, and uh, induce its benef beneficial uh, effects. So for those of you who haven't heard about a deno associated virus, uh, there's now, um, I think maybe of some of you will recognize because now we are debating a lot about COVID and hearing news in, um, about these vaccines. And some of these vaccines like the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, they use this technology, the adeno associated virus, which is called gene therapy to increase um, the levels of a protein of the virus to develop um, immunity in, in people. Uh, but this is the same strategy that we are using, trying to increase irisin levels. And then we are going to do, um, uh, we want to do intravenous treatment uh, of mice. And also we have here at Queens, uh, rhesus monkeys, because it's important to um, test the safety of this approach in a uh, non-human primate before moving um, to clinical trials. Uh, and then, sorry, uh, we hope to increase irisin levels in the brain because this is an important step that needs to be overcome. We have, uh, usually the brain is protected, so it's not very easy to make molecules that are coming from the periphery to go to the brain. But we are hoping to increase uh, irisin levels and improve memory. So the other um, uh, strategy that we are pursuing is to use vesicles now and cell therapy to increase irisin levels in the brains. So let's talk about vesicles. You probably haven't heard about that, but I think better than just saying, it's much easier for us to remember when we see something. So uh, before putting the, uh, playing the video, uh, I'd like to tell you that this is a cell and this is a vesicle. So now I hope you can appreciate that uh, these components are being formed and released and quickly released. And so these are the so-called vesicles. And why do I care for this, uh, the production of these vesicles? Well, they have been shown to physiologically be a, a very important um, mechanism of communication uh, between the cells. And also it has been suggested that it's important way to transport 
um, molecules from the periphery to the brain, from the body to the brain. So uh, we thought, oh, okay, so perhaps we would be able to increase uh, uh, brain irising in these uh, irising in these vesicles. Uh, so telling you about this strategy, when we need something very important to deliver something very important, what do we usually do? We go to the post office and we deliver a package. And what is important is in this package, right? Then there is the transport of this package. And finally, the delivery of this package. And this um, is our hypothesis. So we think that vesicles would be a nice way we would be able to include irising in this um, uh, package, and then it would be transported and then delivered in the brain uh, to um, uh, have, its, uh, have its beneficial actions. And going back here then to our um, uh, cartoon, uh, so what we think is that we can actually, instead of just leaving irising uh, by itself, increasing the levels of irising, we would like to increase the levels of irising in these vesicles, in these compartments, because the, this way we are sure that uh, vesicles will be um, transported into the brain and they would actually uh, improve mechanisms of memory. So in this strategy, we are using stem cells. I hope you have uh, heard about stem cells. This is called cell therapy is being used, uh, trying to be used um, in many diseases in cancer. Uh, it seems to have a potential. So we are using a specific type of stem cells and increasing. Uh, I, so these cells, they produce these vis, uh, vesicles and we are increasing irisin levels in these vesicles in the envelope. Uh, and then we are going to treat mice um, and non-human primates and, sorry, I think there's a problem with my animation, but then we hope this will actually increase irisin levels in the brain and improve memory. And the third um, big step that we are pursuing is trying to op optimize physical exercise protocols in humans, especially in aged humans, uh, to uh, uh, these exercise pro uh, protocols. Uh, we are measuring irising levels, hoping to increase irising levels and improve cognition and increase brain irising in the brain. So as a take home message, um, I like a lot this um, uh, this is the cover of an, an important uh, journal, um, a scientific journal, Science, uh, and um, it's um, actually so true that it takes much more than an apple a day uh, to keep our body and our brain healthy. And what we hope is that uh, with irisin, uh, we actually will be able to keep or actually to uh, retrieve uh, lost memories and improve uh, brain health. Brain health. So I just would like to finish by thank you so much for listening and I'm ready to uh, take answers. So I stopped sharing. Thank you so much, Fernanda. That was an amazing presentation. I think that the, the story that you shared at the beginning was very powerful. Um, and I'm sure that that resonates with a lot of people. So thank you for, for sharing that and being um, vulnerable and, and sharing that text from your, that your daughter wrote. I think that was really touching. Um, so I think, go ahead, Sean, sorry. I was just gonna say, are you going into question and answers now? Yeah, I think we can start with that. So um, if we don't have any other comments from um, our group here, I think we can open up the chat and the question and answer box is available to um, our audience now. And as that's opening, um, I'm been while people are thinking about their questions, I had a couple of questions for you um, and, and uh, kind of on two different levels. One is what type of exercise level would you say would be um, appropriate, say for somebody who's in their 60s? I mean, are they having to do heavy impact training or is it going out around the block for a walk? What does that look like? Yeah, so uh, for brain health, actually, uh, this is, I, I get this question a lot. And unfortunately, based on the study so far, it's needed, um, uh, yes, more uh, high intensity um, exercise, high intensity training exercises. But if you are not able to do that, for sure, 
you should walk around the block because it will just if you if you have to decide that and if you can do more high intense uh, uh, exercise for sure go for that otherwise just that's what I tell my mom my mom can't do so I said go around the block and just walk 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 because you are uh, for sure you are uh, exerting some beneficial effects but not the ones um, in um, that allow improved memory at least in the studies that have been published so far. And we've got a great question in the chat. Uh, will irisin be promoted for all older adults, not just those living with Alzheimer's or dementia? Yes, yes, that's what, uh, that's a great question. And that's, uh, yes, that's what, there is evidence showing uh, that following, actually, and uh, there's few research in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, our paper was the first one actually showing. So because this hormone has been discovered uh, in the uh, diabetes field, so there's lots of research uh, on this hormone, like um, uh, converting a bad type of fat in a better type of fat. Uh, so yes, but what they have shown so far regarding irising is that high intensity training increases irising levels in the blood in health humans. Okay, and then we've got another question in the Q&A that's similar to the one that I asked, uh, but I wanna make sure that it's said, and that is what type of exercise do you recommend, whether it be, like we said, walking around the block steps, um, pulse to max, aerobics, et cetera, but what you're saying is like high intensity, and what would that look like? Yes, yeah, so this looks like um, the treadmill, I'm sorry to say that, or elliptical if you go really quickly, uh, and, uh, or the bike as well. Bike is a good uh, exercise. Uh, so these are the type of exercise that has been shown to, to increase iris in, in the blood. So what we are now trying to see is what types of exercise would increase um, iris in levels in the brain because this is what we want and of course it's not easy to measure that right so we are trying to develop ways to me measure that and now would weightlifting be also considered high impact or is that more your your heart rate isn't as up as high you're just building muscle it's yeah it's not as um as um doesn't increase as much your heart rate weightlifting depends a little bit on the program that you're following uh, but there is one study showing that weightlifting uh, also is good for memory, but not regarding irising. Okay. So what I think whatever exercise you are able or willing or you are capable to do is good for you. We may not know or understand exactly what different types of exercise would do regarding different molecules. Uh, but uh, the important message is to keep exercising as much as you can um, the way that you can. Now, what about, uh, there's a question, I love it. What about line dancing or yoga as a form of, uh, of exercise? Because there are some forms of yoga where it is, it's very quick movement and you yeah. break it. Yeah, so there are no studies yet, but I myself, I do yoga and I like, <laughs> I like what it does and it's good for for, for um, uh, relaxation as well, for different aspects. Meditation has been shown uh, to be good for Alzheimer's disease. So I would also uh, say that it's positive, even though there is no research regarding uh, iris in Alzheimer's disease. So yeah. I'm, I'm not a... Um... I'm not a researcher or a scientist, but I was a yoga teacher in my previous life. And there are some forms of yoga where your heart rate goes up quite high and you break a sweat and you're doing a lot. It's a lot of physical continuous movement. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I agree. I think there's a lot of benefits there. Uh, I, I have one more question if that's okay. Um, so when, so when, and if this drug were released, when, along the Alzheimer's or dementia journey, would a, um, a client or somebody going to their doctor be looking to receive it? I'm not sure I understood the so first once, part. Yeah, so once you've been diagnosed, is there a point where, um, could it be late stage Alzheimer's that people are taking this or is it designed for early onset? I think it would be designed for both, uh, I would say, because just like exercise, if you think about the studies about exercise, exercise has been shown to be uh, a, a nice way to prevent the, the development of dementia or to delay, uh, but also it has um, a, amazing beneficial actions 
in people with mild cognitive impairments or Alzheimer's disease. So there is one study published in 2018 uh, in which they have patients with mild cognitive impairment and a red had some atrophy in the hippocampus, this region important for memory. And they have been subjected to six months of um, an exercise protocol, their high intensity uh, training protocol. And uh, they had uh, a decrease in cognitive um, decline. And uh, also uh, it's amazing, but even the, the hippocampus that uh, was already had some level of atrophy, decreased the level of atrophy. So um, exercise is more powerful than we can actually think about. There's another question in the chat. So would an irisin medication be able to replace high intensity exercise um, that older adults couldn't do? Or is it only a combination of irisin and the actual physical exercise that would work? Well, I, that's a great question. And that's something that I think a lot, uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know even if only irisin. Uh, in mice, it was uh, shown to be the molecule that mediated the positive effect of exercising memory, but we don't know in humans. So it's possible that we may need to use irisin and another molecule that is uh, increased by exercise as well. We have been thinking about that. Uh, and we, it's possible that we will need um, to, uh, to increase irisin levels through a medication, but also have exercise, not just to further increase irisin, but uh, to complement uh, with the production of other neuroprotective molecules as well. Uh, but for someone that has a disability or is really no longer uh, able to exercise, we need to think about these people too, right? And we need uh, to, to try to develop a medication. That makes sense. And then we've got another question here, and that is, uh, is standing while working at a computer exercise versus sitting? <laughs> I, I myself am standing uh, just because uh, in our, yeah, in my job, I, I have to sit down a lot and write a lot of grants, papers and everything, uh, but it's not considered an exercise. It's good for your posture, it's good for other things, but unless you are doing a step, I have seen this, that people while you are working, they do some step, uh, perhaps this would be better, consider exercise. Or bring your bike, your bike up and sit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've seen some desks with treadmills underneath them. So you could type while you're walking slowly. I'm not sure if that's uh, distracting or not for some people. Yeah, and if there is anyone that is listening to this and is very shy and think it's shy to do the question, don't be. Just um, ask uh, whatever you would like to ask, and I will try to answer if I have. Uh, Great the... point. Um, Fernanda, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about um, your experience working in research um, and receiving the funding from the ASRP. I know that you were receiving it um, prior to COVID-19 um, affecting the workplace, but I'm just wondering if you have any comments about um, any setbacks you might be experiencing now because of the pandemic um, related to your research too, I know that a lot of people are trying to encourage more activity and movement, especially um, with older adults during this time. It's hard to get out. I'm just wondering if you have any comments about that for our audience. I do, and I hope I'm, I, I don't mean to scare anyone, but um, um, some research that I have been involved, and especially in Brazil, because as you probably hear, the situation in Brazil is very bad, out of control. Uh, there's no um, um, really um, actions to decrease uh, the transmission of the virus. We have the variants already there and uh, it's a chaos. So we have a large number of, um, of patients and um, we are following actually. So I'm involved in COVID research and um, many of these patients, you probably heard that because it is in the news already, uh, they actually uh, uh, develop cognitive deficits. Some of these patients, they develop neurological complications. So COVID just do not impact like the lungs uh, or the heart. So it may also impact the brain. So there is lots of cases of stroke encephalitis and everything and, and so on and other cases. Uh, and um, what we are doing is to follow um, patients that um, had COVID 
not specifically uh, neurological manifestations, but it's a large group, 250, and we are following them and doing cognitive testes three months set after hospital discharge, six months and one year. We are now at the six month uh, time point. And many of them, they do develop, uh, unfortunately, they, they have persistent cognitive um, related issues, some of them, cognitive impairment. Um, so these, I think, will impact in a, this is not regarding my research, but in some way I was, uh, I had actually to jump into this. Uh, because we are actually worried about how persistent this sort of inflammation in the brain is, is, is and how this may favor the development of Alzheimer's disease. So this is something that I think it's very important for us to be aware of and to be safe, of course, as much as we can. Uh, uh, and this is something that Alzheimer's society probably will um, be addressing in the near future, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, but thank God, the situation here in Canada is much better. Uh, and here in Kingston, uh, where I am, the situation is much, much better. I think you know that uh, Kingston is one of the uh, safest places with fewer cases of COVID. So in regarding my, my so I'm a, I have been able to, to keep my research uh, going here. So it has an impact like um, what I'm doing right now. But I'm, I know that other colleagues that are in the shutdown and everything are being highly impacted. I hope I answered everything. Yeah, and there's another question here based on what you just said, uh, and that is a comment of that's an amazing discovery and down the road, will it be shared with Health Canada so they can produce and distribute physical activity guide as they've similarly done with the, uh, the food guide? Yeah, yes, I think this is uh, actually what um, uh, we, we want and we are hoping for. And as you can see, and this is something that uh, makes me very happy, when you look at um, um, uh, the websites of Alzheimer's Society Canada and other societies where patients with uh, and family and caregivers of Alzheimer's disease follow, there is there the information. And of course, this is not just based in my research, it's based in many other uh, evidence indicating the beneficial actions of exercise in the brain and in Alzheimer's disease. So yes, I think this is very important to make people aware as much as we can about this because uh, this is what we can do right now. Okay, we've got another uh, question. Um, comes from a gentleman. I am diagnosed with amylide tau positive via spinal tap. Is this related to the irisin? Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I understood. So someone, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so, so uh, a gentleman's been diagnosed with amyloid, he's been diagnosed amyloid tau positive uh -huh. by a spinal tap and wondering if the diagnosis is in relation to the, uh, I guess, lack of virus and making it to his brain. Yeah, that might be, but we, I, I don't think we have evidence to say that it, it is. Uh, uh, because uh, what we can say uh, is that there is a correlation. So people that have less iris in the brain, uh, they have um, uh, a less, um, uh, we didn't look at specifically at the levels of amyloid by TAP uh, uh, exam, but uh, we look at um, uh, a memory related score like the MMSC E. And uh, so when you have lower levels of iris in the brain, indeed, you do uh, worse in this cognitive testing. And if you have higher iris in, you do better. So, but this is not, this is just a correlation. We cannot say that one thing leads to another. I hope I was clear. So to, to understand better, we have to go to the uh, animal studies to understand what the cause and effect is. So that's why it's important to do both animal and human uh, research. We've got another uh, comment that this is also a, an amazing presentation. And uh, how long have you been working on this particular study for? Yeah, that's a good question uh, because it gives you an idea um, of uh, that science takes time, right? So it took me seven years since I, I, I was uh, in the scientific meeting because of my, my research um, sits in the interface between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. So I was in a um, scientific meeting of uh, diabetes 
where Bruce Spiegelman presented for the first time his discovery of irisin. And then I immediately, in 2012, started to, to investigate. Uh, we didn't have a lot of reagents because it was a newly um, um, uh, discovered hormone. And it took me a long time, yeah. And, and took a, take a lot of money too. So it's very important to support research. I have had support from Alzheimer's Society. I used all the money that I received from Alzheimer's Society in this project, but I also needed to uh, add other fundings because it, it is really expensive uh, research. And you're still working on it, right? I'm still working as I'm trying to move forward, yeah. <laughs> So I have another question for you, Fernanda. You mentioned, um, and also in Caitlin's introduction, um, your work with uh, the research institution in Brazil in Rio de Janeiro. I was just wondering, um, maybe what are some of your lessons learned when working with two research institutions? Do you often share um, the work sort of uh, interdisciplinary between um, your two research groups? I'm just yeah. Yes, I think it has been um, wonderful uh, to, to be in two different places. And um, that's exactly what you say. I think we get a lot of feedback uh, working in two different stations and people think in a different ways with different, different colleagues. But I won't be able to keep up <laughs> this for too long. So I've decided to stay in Canada. Yeah. We've got another couple of questions here. So if one has been active their whole life, does irisin get stored or does it continually need to be produced? Yeah, so we, we don't know exactly about the reserve that you can um, uh, keep uh, in the brain based on uh, your history. So it looks like the effect of exercise um, needs to be continuous. So you can have the, the, the actions of, to have the beneficial acts of, of exercise, this needs to be continuous because then what happens is that the molecules are washed off because they, they have a time uh, that um, they stay wherever they are in the body. Uh, so they need to be replaced. So uh, it would need to be continuous, yes. So keep exercising. Keep exercising, that's the, the message. We have another comment and question here. So thank you so much. As uh, as mom, her mom's caregiver, I need to take time for high intensity exercise for my own health. Um, and she's asking, are you able to at this time in researching know approximately when irisin, uh, a drug similar to irisin, would be available? I, uh, I get these questions as well a lot, and it's very hard for me to try to think. It depends so much because uh, we create this hypothesis as I presented to you. I hope you was able to appreciate, but we never know, we, may be, we might be wrong. And uh, we have so many steps in research. We need funding, of course, to be able to do what we planned. But then even when we get the funding that we need, uh, we, uh, there are too many steps. So I presented to you, we have to do some animal and um, uh, mice, and then we move to the non-human primates for safety. So it takes a while. So I wouldn't say if um, I had a lot of money and um, everything goes super well, it would take, I would say like four years at least for this research to be uh, completed. If nothing goes wrong, but this doesn't help happen in science. We've got another uh, comment and question here, and that is that I've heard that Alzheimer's research is one of the lowest funded of all major diseases. That's correct. Considering how many millions of people who are at risk, this is hard to understand. Are there any suggestions from your perspective of how we could change this? Uh, I think the only way is to uh, make people aware uh, of the condition, because I, don't, I, I, I sincerely don't know if everyone is aware that uh, for many diseases, we have a treatment, we have a medication, we are able to kind of slow down the progression. Of course, uh, not for some very um, rare and aggressive tumors, for example, but cancer. Think about how much we have evolved in cancer research. We are being able to treat so many types of cancer. And it has been a lot of uh, support for cancer research and it should, be, should continue, don't get me wrong. Uh, but for Alzheimer's disease, and I don't know it's because this is a disease that affects elderly people. 
so they are not uh, in the product productive uh, part of life uh, in ways anymore. Um, um, but I don't know. I think uh, we need to make aware that we need research to find a way to fight disease and to give uh, back um, life to the ears of a patient. It's, just, just, it's not just like giving ears, right? But giving, make uh, them, uh, uh, these patients to have a, a great uh, a life, even when they are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So we need to be able to treat this disease. Yeah, thank you. That's wonderful. I echo everyone's comments that that was an amazing presentation. And um, in speaking to many donors and clients, a lot of them um, are really interested, particularly in the last year, maybe it's because we're all home, but about um, prevention and early diagnosis and detection and uh, what we can do on our own without medical intervention to, to delay or prevent. So this has been absolutely amazing. Thank you. It was great. Thank you all for joining. I'm, I'm sad that I can't see the faces. I like to, to yes. give these talks when I am actually able to see and interact and smile with you. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to do this in the near future. Hoping we can connect again and, and have another, for those who are local, have an in-person um, meeting. I think that would be wonderful in presentation. I'm just hoping we could end off with one last question. Um, I think that relates uh, more specifically to uh, some of the more technical parts of your presentation. And the question is, why can't irisin be measured in the human brain, but it can be in a monkey or animal models? Yeah, uh, because uh, for us to measure in the brain, we need invasive procedures, right, in humans. So the brain is very protected. Uh, the only way uh, we can access what is going on in the brain is to do a spinal tap and collect CSF. So this is invasive. We will not do that unless uh, this is really needed. That is an indication uh, for that, a clinical indication that you need the spinal tap. Uh, and uh, on, on, on the other hand, this is the advantage of uh, working with um, animals. We can do, of course, with all the approval, the ethics approval, and, and making sure that there is no suffering, but we can uh, do this more invasive uh, testing. So we can also obtain, uh, we can actually obtain the brain uh, after um, uh, the animals are recognized. And, uh, and we can look at this, that's how, how research progress. So we are actually able to look what's going on in these brains. And uh, on the other hand, in the humans, we can only do that post-mortem if we have access to uh, the samples, uh, but we cannot get inside. Can we modify this? Uh, can we modify that? So that's why it is important in research to do both what we call basic research, translational. Re basic is just looking at animals. Translational, when we try to translate these findings into humans and clinical research as well. And for those who are shy, but want to ask me a question, feel free to send me an email. I, I, um, if you are able to provide my email, I'll be more than happy to, to take questions as well. That would be wonderful. Yeah, maybe we can send that out in the follow-up email um, after this presentation to uh, the, those who are in attendance today. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Fernanda. I, I can't thank you enough for helping us host this, this webinar. Um, it's the third of our, our presentation series um, through the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. And um, we hope to continue presenting um, more of our funded researchers so that um, our audiences can learn more about um, the work that we funded. And it's an honor to be able to do this because as I had mentioned earlier to Fernanda before we started, you know, we never really got to meet people as often as we did before. We all started working from home or just connecting more often. Yeah. Over internet. So it's been a real honor to have you with us today. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for the support to my research. And thank you all for participating. Great. Thank you again, Fernanda. And thank you also, Sean, for uh, co-hosting and moderating the question and answer period. Thanks very much. An awesome experience. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.